Ibn Battuta, a global history documentary. Ibn Battuta was born February 24, 1304 in Tanya, Morocco. He was born into a family of Muslim judges. His mother was Fatoma, but unfortunately I was not able to find any information on his father or his father's name. Maliki Muslims requested that Ibn Battuta serve as their religious judge, as he was from an area where it was practiced. Battuta's full name was extremely long, but he was commonly known as Shams Adin. In the top left corner, there is a map of Tanyer in Morocco. In the bottom right corner, there is a picture of Tanyer in 1304. In 1325, at age 21, Ibn Battuta left his homeland for the Middle East. He intended to complete his Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, but he also wished to study Islamic law along the way. His journey to Mecca would take him 16 months. He would not return to Morocco for 24 years. On the left, there is a picture of the Quran, which is the book of Islamic law. On the right, there is a picture of Mecca in 1325. Ibn Battuta crossed the Red Sea and Arabian Desert during his travels to Iran and Iraq. When he arrived in Najaf, he visited the mausoleum of Ali, the fourth caliph. Then, instead of continuing to Baghdad with the caravan, Ibn Battuta started a six-month detour that took him to, into Iran, then followed the Tigris River to Basra. When Ibn Battuta arrived in Iraq, Persia and Iraq were still suffering from the devastating effects of the Mongol invasion a century before. On the left, there is a map of Iraq in 1325. And on the right, there is a map of Iran in 1325. Fatuta traveled to Mecca overland, following the North African coast across the Sultanate of Abd al Wadid and Hafsid. The route took him through Tlemcen, Beja, and then Tunis, where he stayed for two months. He took a ride in the town of Sfax, but soon left her due to a dispute with her, the father. On the left, there's a map of Sfax in 1325, and on the right, there's a picture of Ibn Battuta in Sfax. Once in Tunis, Tunisia, the caravan set off and its passengers began their hajj. During this time, Ibn Battuta was appointed Qudi, also known as the judge and settler of the caravan's dispute. Sometime in 1326, Ibn Battuta and others arrived in Alexandria at the western end of the Nile Delta. Ibn stated in his journals of his journey that Alexandria was one of the five most magnificent places he had visited. Once departing from Alexandria, Battuta and his companions arrived in Cario, where Battuta resided for a month before deciding to venture towards Mecca on his own. Ibn Battuta then passed through places like Jerusalem, and Bethlehem and experienced many holy and historically important places, such as towns ravaged by crusades, Tyre and Agri. He proceeded in the direction of Damascus and reached it in 1326, coincidentally during the holy month of Ramadan, telling more stories of holy men and assassins with things like poison, knives, and war. After his short duration in Damascus, he continued down south towards Mecca, which at that point stood around 820 miles away. Carrying on his journey back on the caravan, it is expected that the journey took approximately 45 to 60 days before they made it to the walls of Medina without conflict. The caravan brought its passengers to many holy sites in Medina before they finally came close to entering Mecca. Furthermore, Ibn Battuta spent three weeks in Mecca where he studied with other men and visited the many sites located in Mecca. Ibn graduated to the status of Al-Hajj, meaning that he successfully completed his Hajj. After this three-week period, on November 17, 1326, Ibn joined yet another caravan of pilgrims and traveled with them to the Persian state. About 100 years before Ibn Battuta's travels, the Mongols invaded Persia and Iraq. The Mongols were ruthless, bringing death and devastation wherever they conquered, and eventually brought the Abbasid Caliphate dynasty to an end. When Ibn Battuta continued his journey to the overthrown territory of Persia, it was clear that the economy and agricultural prosperity had taken a punch and still hadn't recovered. Battuta also witnessed the positive outcomes of the invasion and the effect that the Mongol rule had on the Persians. After studying in Mecca and passing through Persia, Ibn Battuta started a new adventure on the Red Sea. Along with a group of other pilgrims, Batuta was shoved onto a small ship called a Dao. These boats were very unstable, and this was Batuta's first time at sea. The Red Sea was hard to navigate and full of pirates waiting to attack people who weren't expecting it. Once the group got to the shore of Yemen, Ibn Batuta was able to rent a camel and visit some coastal cities. He spent a short time in Taiz before going down to the city of Aden, then adventured down the coast of East Africa before settling down to a permanent job.
Thanks to the predictable patterns of the monsoon winds in the Indian Ocean, Ibn Battuta was able to plan out his next trip through the Arabian Sea without weather complications. After heading south along Africa, he went back up north to the coast of Arabia. After days of walking, becoming sick, and suffering through the pains of swollen and bloody feet, they made it to Kaha and stayed with the governor while they recovered. After regaining his strength, he continued to the Strait of Hormuz, observing busy markets and pearl fishing boats. After spending one year in Mecca studying and making his third pilgrimage, he thought about making a trip to India. He decided he would get to India after a detour through Anatolia. In a small group of other travelers, Ibn Battuta left for Anatolia, which is in Turkey. Leaving Turkey, Ibn Battuta and his friends boarded a ship on the Black Sea, which was stormy and dangerous. He stopped in Constantinople for over a month, visited the Hagia Sophia, met the emperor at the time, and saw all the sights. For months and months, Ibn Battuta was finally on his way to India. Ibn Battuta left Africa and traveled to India through the high mountains of Afghanistan, which followed the footsteps of the Turkish warriors before him. Ibn Battuta reported that the Sultan Muhammad was a very cruel and harsh leader. Even though there were harsh rules, he stayed in India because of wealth and high ornament. Ibn Battuta lived an easy life in India, but his position came with some dangers. This was due to the fact that Sultan Muhammad did not trust many. To continue, Ibn Battuta in 1334 traveled to Delhi seeking a job. He ended up becoming a judge and would become friends with the Sultan. They would go on elaborate hunting expeditions which involved tents, elephants, and servants to carry what was needed. Since Sultan Muhammad was a paranoid man, he thought Ibn Battuta would plot against him. So he told Ibn Battuta to leave because he was going to be the ambassador to the Mongol court of China. He took this task because he wanted to be as far away from the Sultan since he feared him. Before arriving in China, Ibn Battuta traveled to the Maldive Islands. However, he had a series of failures in the islands. He lost everything he owned by shipwrecks and pirates, and he ended up going to China alone. The first place he sailed to after leaving India was Chittagong, which was a Muslim country next to India. Then, Ibn Battuta went up the Meghna River to find the holy man and share stories. He stayed there for three days before leaving to complete his journey. After sailing for about 40 days, he arrived at the busy seaport of Chanchu. Ibn Battuta admired what China had, but did not like the culture shock he experienced during the time he was there. He expressed that China was beautiful, but it did not please me. On the contrary, I was greatly troubled thinking about the paganism dominated this country. Whenever I went out of my lodging, I saw many blameworthy things. That disturbed me so much that I stayed indoors most of the time and only went out when necessary. So to make China more interesting, Ibn Battuta visited the largest city in the world during the 14th century, Hangzhou, and then got on board to sail home. Due to the Black Plague, many people were passing away. With death all around him, perhaps he felt the need to go home. He was 45 years old and had been gone for 24 years. He once again headed back towards Morocco. Ibn Battuta even said, I was moved by the memories of my homeland, affection for my family and dear friends, who drew me towards my land. Ibn Battuta returned to his homeland, Tangier, in 1349. On his journey back to Tangier, he learned in Damascus that his father had also passed away 15 years earlier. He stayed at Tangier only for a few nights before continuing his journey. During Ibn Battuta's first visit to Cairo, he heard many stories about the legendary Mansa Musa, king of Mali. Mansa Musa flooded Cairo with its kindness and so much gold was given that the value of gold had changed. A trip to Mali, like all other trips, would be made easier because of already established trade routes controlled by Muslims. Ibn Battuta sat out from Fez in the autumn of 1351 and crossed the Atlas Mountains. After traveling for eight or nine days, he arrived at a town called Sijilmosa. This was the last outpost before crossing the vast Sahara Desert. And so he set out across the Sahara Desert for Walata in a camel caravan in February 1352. He stayed by many villages to rest like Tarhaza and Walata. Ibn Battuta's final travel was across the Sahara Desert from Granada to the West African Empire of Mali in 1352. He stayed there for one year until he began to make his return to his home country of Morocco in 1353 because he was asked to return by the Sultan. When he arrived, he told about his travels to a writer named Ibn Juzay who wrote in an ornate style using fragments of poetry. Much of the details of Ibn Battuta's death are unknown,
but it is thought that he died somewhere between 1368 and 1377. He was later buried in the town of Tangier, where he was born. Ibn Battuta is thought to be the traveler of Islam by many historians and Islamic people. He traveled 75,000 miles, which wasn't surpassed by anyone before steam power was invented. He visited many Muslim and non-Muslim lands. Ibn Battuta wrote a book called The Rila that told of aspects of the social, cultural, and political history of the Muslim world and tracked all of his travels. It also depicted how he met over 60 rulers and has known or visited the tombs of 2,000 other identifiable people.